So let me just say welcome um, to B Global's next event, all talking about um, remote working, etc. I'm not the main speaker, but my name is uh, Councillor Leslie Ayula, I'm founder of B Global, but we've got uh, our main speaker, which will be coming and be joining you very, very, very shortly. Um, just wanted to say uh, apologies for the, the late start. We had some technical issues here at Mansfield Library, but I just wanted to say thank you for uh, Leon at BIPC for allowing us to use the venue. Obviously, we've got a deputy, is it deputy Lord Mayor? We, deputy, yeah, de deputy. We've got, we've got Lord Mayors in, in Nottingham, but so deputy mayor uh, in Mansell Rivers, and now we've got a number, a number of businesses here. So all I want to do, not to really take up too much time, but just take you through a history of B Global, and where we've come from, and, um, and, and what we're about. I think um, if I can start. Uh, by, by speaking about what why B Global. B Global is uh, a business association, first started up in, in Nottingham, Nottingham City, and the focus is it was focused on working with black, Asian, and ethnic minority businesses. And it's really to get them into the mainstream of business support. And that business support is, is supposed to be there to support all businesses, but for a variety of reasons, not all businesses are tapping into, in, in, into that. Um, uh, into that um, scenario and, and network. And one of the benefits um, of the reason why we, we set up is because um, a number of years ago, some research was done which stated that the 25 billion pounds of uh, gross value added is generated into the UK economy from ethnic minority businesses. Now that's a, a, a great amount. I know we, we had a, a vote a number of years ago, Brexit, happened and we all decided as a country to leave. But one of the benefits of having, uh, doing work with ethnic minority businesses, one, it adds to the, the, the GVA, but also creates opportunities for us to do a lot of work in a, um, outside of the country, um, across the Commonwealth and across uh, Europe and, and, and else, elsewhere, or well, outside of Europe, should I say. So, Again, it was also to help address some of the unemployment challenges, which were which were um, focused on uh, black and ethnic minorities uh, in the in the city, but also ac across the county as well. So, why be global? Again, we really wanted to focus on access to finance because historically, a lot of businesses were finding that they they had challenges challenges uh, accessing finance, especially from from the banks underrepresented in uh, public sector and private sector supply chains. You know, it's, it's, it's really important, obviously, when businesses are starting off, is that they're tapped into the right uh, supply chains. Because obviously that brings uh, value to the business, value to um, what, what they have to, uh, you know, have, have to offer, and it enables businesses to actually grow. And, and that's one of the struggles with uh, some businesses. If they're not growing at a, a, a regular rate, uh, then they, they do find it really, really hard to, um, you know, sc scale up, scale up their business. So, being a part of uh, um, a strong um, supply chain would obviously help and uh, help grow, grow your business. Again, um, this this goes for the public sector as well as the the private sector. Challenges around capacity to comply with tendering uh, up, um, tendering uh, requirements. When you're actually um, entering public sector contracting and also private sector, um, the tendering requirements can be can be quite uh, strenuous. And we've realised that obviously many ethnic minority businesses do struggle with that. But if they can get the right support, they'll be able to grow and, and develop just like the mainstream businesses. So again, uh, low use of um, mainstream business support services. Uh, we use a, a, a technique. Um, and a model would be global 
is that we, we don't expect businesses to come to us, we go to them. So it's a merger of uh, business support as well as community development. Opportunities as well, what we just mentioned uh, you know, about presenting self straight after Brexit. We've got the Commonwealth Games, which is uh, taking place in Birmingham very shortly. And some of the opportunities about trading with the Commonwealth are, are, on, are on our doorsteps. And obviously, a lot of the Commonwealth countries are, uh, you know, doing partnerships with, with British businesses to be able to, uh, us to, one, seek the benefits of trading with them, but also we're looking at inward investments. So these businesses can invest here uh, in, in, in the UK as well. So where did it come from? If I just give a quick potted history of um, of uh, Be Global, it, it, it started out of an organisation called uh, Community Partnership Forum. The then mayor of uh, the city of Nottingham, uh, Melita Bryan, what she did, she set up an organisation which came, which was birthed out of the 2011 uh, uh, rights here, here, in the, in, here in the country. And one of the issues was is that she wanted to find some solutions and she brought together about 60 or so organisations to try and address that. We were one of those organisations. At the time, I was working with an organisation called Inspiring Greatness. And they um, put on a, um, an event, it was called BEAD, it's supposed to be Black Youth Entrepreneurship Employment Day. And it's, we, we asked the audience at that time, um, what do you think about having an ethnic minority business network, black business network? And overwhelmingly, they said yes. So that started a process. We then worked with a number of two, number one or two um, uh, local uh, business people. One named Audra Winter, another was, one's called Mike Corey Bent. Uh, they helped with about 18 month period. And then we took it on to um, working with the local authority and building a partnership with them, which that partnership's been going about four or five years now. And one of the first events which we did back in the 2017 hosted event um, with the, um, it's, it's like a, a monarch in Nigeria called the Oni Avife. And I know Lola would, would, would verify uh, the, the Oni Avife. Uh, normally when he comes to uh, the UK, he normally just goes to London, but we had an opportunity and privilege to host him in Nottingham City uh, in, in the council house. And these are some of the pictures that we came. It was supposed to be a quiet event. Um, the, the officers were saying to us that, um, you know, it, We've only got space for about 20, 30 people in a room, etc. Not understanding the Nigeria culture and how it's very uh, uh, boisterous and 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 very, um, in, in a sense, it gives a lot of sh showcase and, and flying buoyancy to it. And um, it was a great event, and it was uh, that started our relationship with uh, the Nigerian and um, British Chamber of Commerce and also the Nigerian Shipping. Uh, association and it was a great event and obviously that started uh, the links between ourselves here in Nottingham and, and, and uh, Nigeria. So again um, we had a number of roundtable uh, uh, round discussions and this was some of, some of the people who, who, who attended and um, that and again started the process to, to get to where we are today in, in doing more business uh, across the, the, the city. So started out with doing, and this is obviously pre-pandemic, where obviously regular, having regular events, which are, you know, face-to-face, -face. we're doing a number of events um, there. And then we developed a, a strategic board, which then uh, is formed into our board of directors now, and also our... Uh, 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 what was called our advisory board and obviously Leon Dale is one of the latest um, members to join our, our advisory board. So again is some of the events what we've done over the um, over the years and, and the partnerships we, we've actually formed and basically was trying to say that there's, there's much more to come so and that was all taken up to you know, you know, pre-pandemic but one of the things what we, we the contracts what we got now at the moment time is um, with the Chamber of Commerce. It's called a CRF program. It's called a Community Renewal Fund. It's it's, it's as a result of the um, decision to come out of uh, the EU. The UK government decided, and, and rightfully so, that actually we're going to be losing a lot of investment um, from from the EU, and so we need to backfill that. Um, there's obviously questions about how much money we'd actually get from it. Um, 
through this new C uh, CRF program and the Shared Prosperity Fund. But that, that aside, uh, this was a pilot program lasting uh, so, uh, six months. And um, it was for the, uh, Nottingham City, but also uh, Mansfield District Council area, Bassett Law and Newcanshire District Council area. Um, we've just been granted an extension to that program. So any businesses, again, uh, within those uh, three shire areas, Mansfield, uh, Bassett Law and Newark and Sherwood can get access to uh, to support. And obviously there's some businesses here who, uh, uh, you know, got, got some support from us uh, on, on, on this program. So I think that's uh, coming to the end of, it's just obviously a summary of what we do, end of my presentation. Um, I just want to, um, I don't know if anybody else has got any questions, but I think we'll probably go to questions and answers later. So, uh, Leon, um, did you want to come? Hello everyone, my name's Leon Dale. I'm from the Business IP Centre in Nottingshire. So I just want to thank you for everyone for joining for us today and just a few words. So a little bit of clearing house as, as normal, I have to do a bit of the house duties. So everyone on stream will hear this, but basically if there is a fire alarm which you're not anticipating any tests or anything else, follow myself to the back, follow the exits and the staff will direct you out to the fire exits as, as appropriate. Um, but in the self, for what B Global is doing and especially this event as well, it showcases the support that's available for businesses and for everyone around. So just want to give a few words about the benefits of what that can improve to businesses around. So the BIBC has been in Mansfield probably about eight months now or a little bit over and we've had a huge uptake and that's a lot of businesses that want support. Now with that, B Global's now come in with ourselves and we're supporting more and more businesses and Mansfield really wants to promote and the deputy mayor can really achieve to this and, and really say to it is that they want to promote diversity and that's what B Global represents. We obviously represents just business support in general, but as a combined effort with the council, B Global and myself, we're really putting a big push towards that and showcasing more diverse culture, more diverse businesses on the high street, more boutiques, independents that showcase what is out there and to offer. So that's just my little take. You'll hear a bit more about myself later on, um, but I think we're gonna pass over to Andrew if I'm correct now. Fantastic. <laughs> No worries. Well, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit more about the BIPC then. So we'll go to a few questions and answers. I've got a few businesses here today that I'd like to highlight as well anyway. Um, but the Business IP Centre, we're based in, in Nottinghamshire, so we cover the whole range. Um, we've got four hubs around Nottingham. So we have Mansfield Central Library, Beeston, Sutton Nashfield, um, and uh, sorry, and uh, Bullwell in the city. Now, the BIPC itself is a network of just over, I think we're about 25 now or 27. Um, it's a national network. We've got BIPCs all the way from Devon to Glasgow, so a huge range. We're funded by the government from DCMS, so Digital Culture, Media and Sports. And, and what we're here to essentially do is free support to anyone and everyone. There is no criteria. A lot of business support, and Leslie can say this, and, and many of us that have, been in, that have had and looked for business support, there's criteria. And usually that criteria stops a lot of entry level business, people that are just starting out. And they're the ones that need the most support. Those that may be self-employed and just getting by, but that little bit more of a push could help them solidify, start employing people, boosting the economy, taking over the empty shops that you see on the high streets. And that's what we do. And we combine efforts with B Global and other uh, entities around the UK. That's what we've been doing. So the BIPC Centre, even though we're not in base, there's a network of us that we share ideas, we share thoughts, we look at grant opportunities, we look at entrepreneurs that will share their skill set with you. And that support comes in a host of different webinars like we're doing today through to uh, a variation of one-to-one -one support. So Leslie does it, Leslie's team provides one-to-one -one support with advisors. I provide this out, uh, the same as well. I come from a business background of running my own businesses. Uh, and then on top of that, we have one of our biggest draws, um, which a lot of people always ask, especially I know B Global has asked that every other partner we've had. We have databases, which is five million pounds worth of access. And that provides so much resource to business. It's never been accessed to the general public before and all you need to access is a library card, it's not a big ask. <laughs> so with that in those uh, databases, it covers from finding grants. We've got a database that helps you find every grant or award available in the UK. If it's listed tomorrow, listed today, there'll be a notification that's listed and you'll be able to go see it. If you have really early stage and not sure about your business or where to go or how to do it, we have another database called Cobra, which I tell everyone to use regardless of where you're in business, it becomes your handbook. And you're looking at, how do I set up a limited company? What do I need to do? 
okay, now I know I've set up a limit. How do I employ someone? You know, general questions. Okay, I want to start a cafe, for example. Where do I go to get supplies? Do I need trading licenses? Do I need certain health and hygiene certificates? What's trading standards going to say? These are all partners and entities that you can find through Cobra. And there's many more. We have market research, um, company information. We can even, we have a database that helps you create business leads. Who can say it's going to give you business for free? I used to work at a company, used to buy them. <laughs> They're not cheap. We're giving them away for free. We have a database called Compass where, let's say you're a product manufacturer and your, pro your product is plastic, right? And that's what you produce. And now you're, okay, who can I contact? Where do, who do I contact to sell my plastic to? We can get you a database and say, here's a thousand businesses, go contact them all. We're literally giving it you, you just need to come and take it. It's as simple as that. So the BIPC is here to help, along with B Globe and other entities around the UK. And yeah, we've we've put a bit of a foothold in Matsfield and um and now we're hoping to do more with, with B Global as well. So for, for my take, I think that's kind of the thing to say. And I wanted to highlight some of the business we have here today. So first of all, I want Grant to come join me. Come on, Grant. <laughs> I just want you to say a few words about your business and what it is you do. So Grant's currently one of the um, businesses I work with. And um, yeah, if you can just say a few words about what it is that you do, Grant. I know this is a bit un uh, unpredictable, but, um, but here we go. I'm Grant, I'm new to the K trade industry and um, I'm bringing burgers gourmet burgers especially to the market you gotta tell them about the breakfast burger the brunch burger come on this okay. is one of the best ones <laughs> okay so we, we do a brunch burger which is sausage patty wrapped in bacon brioche buns cut out on top with egg in the middle so pretty much not something you'll see every day and he does a lot of his patties are all freshly so he's supporting local businesses so in relation to supporting local businesses what he's doing he's going to butchers he's getting his meat from a local butcher he prepares the meat himself by hand they have his own special recipes these are the kind of businesses we're supporting i know grant recently went and cut an application through with be global and that's helped grant pay for the wrap on his burger truck that he's now going to be taking around and i know with conversations that today they may be seeing him a bit more in a few more places around mansfield and different places but grant's looking to expand his business as he starts to get off the floor um, so that's one of the bits I want to highlight. I want to say round of applause for Grant for talking about. I know it's quite unprecedented, um, but not a problem at all. Um, Leslie, is there any businesses you want to highlight that are here today? Well, there's a few businesses we want to, um, let, let's, let's say, um, might want to showcase some of their businesses. Shiraz, Lola. <laughs> Leslie. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 let's, let's come. Yeah. This is, um, well, I'll allow you to introduce yourself and then uh, state what, what business and, and how you... Right, so I'm Shiraz, um, the business uh, <coughs> is for Blind Spot. It's a nightclub in Mansfield. So, well yeah. too much. Yeah, yeah. It's, been <laughs> it's been a year, so we started last year, it's been a year, it's doing fine. Have you heard of Blind Spot? Yeah, so... And what, were some, of, what were some of the challenges that you had, obviously, with, with, with Blind Spot? Obviously, by the, the pandemic, etc. Yeah, because when we opened, um, we were in pandemic, coming out of pandemic. Mm. So nightclubs were not allowed to open. So we started as a bar, first of all. And then with time when the restrictions were taken off, uh, we, we opened as a club then. So it wasn't too bad. Yeah. A bit bumpy ride, but it was all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, it just, just to say, but obviously we've w been working with uh, Shiraz um, to put in an application, obviously with the benefit of, of the uh, Chamber of Commerce through the uh, Community Renewal Fund um, and putting in an application to support his, his business. Because obviously he's got some, um, uh, there's a lot of competition uh, in the night, night, night economy yeah. in, in Mansfield, but obviously uh, we're trying to support him to see um, if he can uh, access some of, some of the funding and hopefully in the next few days or so you should be able to get a, a positive no you've already you've already, already actually already you've already got, got yeah there's got some others so yes he has been successful um and hopefully the work will start hopefully yeah, mainly for the smoking area only. okay and the work should start when uh, hopefully soon hopefully soon yeah by, so hopefully by yeah few, week next two, week week yeah. or two the work work will start so yeah that's um that's just one of the businesses we've been supporting great thank, thank you. you brilliant brilliant okay so um, I know we're, we're going to come to a, just a short break, uh, I, I would say, at the moment in time. And then um, after the break, um, we're going to have uh, Andrew Dayton who's going to come uh, uh, come and can speak to you. And then obviously, um, I'll have a round of qu questions and answers as well. So thanks a lot for that. And uh, we'll see you after the break. Thank you.
Also, als ich da und kann das anschauen. Welcome back everyone, thank you for joining us again. So with next segment I'm going to pass over to is Andrew who's here to talk about the importance of team building and, and managing teams remotely. Um, so I'll just pass it to Andrew, he can do a bit, a bit of a brief introduction and then he'll go into sort of talking about it and be a very valuable learning lesson for everyone, essentially. So um, let's uh, invite Andrew over to, to take over really. Over to you Andrew. Cheers Liam. Hi everyone, so I'm <clears throat> Andrew Deaton. I run AWD Development Solutions, which is a training and development consultancy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I worked at Rolls Royce for 26 years across various bits in Derby and then overseas for a while and then came back. Looked after all the early career and graduate and recruitment. So quite a big part of the business looking after 2000 trainees at any one time, 14,000 applications a year coming through the, the part of the business that I looked after. So. Um, I was there for 26 years. I was made redundant back in f April 2014. And I thought, what do I want to do? And I, th I decided that I didn't want to go for another job. I thought I'd give it a go and set up my own business to do the things that I enjoyed doing, not the things I had to do, because I think that's really important that you, did you do something that you really enjoy doing, especially if you're doing it on your own. So it's just me in the business. Um, I, I don't want, I'm at the stage where I don't want the sort of the, the the employees and the team I'm quite happy um, doing what I do and with the freedom and the flexibility to do what I want when I want really so um set up the business eight years ago focusing on particularly training um, consultancy sort of work 
processes, helping businesses with change, helping businesses with startups, coaching and, and facilitating management teams with their strategies and things like that, as well as team building. My particular area of exper expertise and interest is around building teams. That's what I really enjoy doing. So um, I was asked to, to come along and do a, a, a little bit of a talk around building high high performing remote teams but i'm gonna what what i talk about today will actually cover anything so if you if you've got face-to-face -face teams so obviously certain things you can't do remotely it's impossible you know if you if you if you're doing in sort of catering stuff you, you can't have remote teams but all the stuff i talk about during this session is just as relevant for face-to-face -face teams okay so i think that's really important to use i will have a bit of an emphasis on remote teams because that's what i was asked to talk about but conscious that there'll be a lot of different sort of businesses in in the room and on the on the live stream so um there was a, a survey done a few months ago by the association of training and development and they found that before covid only 20 percent of managers had a remote team or a, or a hybrid team so hybrid is where you've got people working at home sometimes in the office mixing it around but now that number 70 percent so that's a massive increase obviously since since the sort of the pandemic people have shifted people want to work from home they want to work flexibly now i know a lot of companies i work with they can't get people to join them unless they offer flexible working working from home 47 percent of organizations expect to keep the same level of hybrid working or remote working for the next five years 34 percent expect it to increase and only 17% expect it to decrease in the next five years. So I think it's here to stay in some form. I think some people will want to go back into an office environment or into a workplace environment. Some will be very happy just working remotely and flexibly. And the top, the top concerns that people had were lack of collaboration, lack of teamwork and lack of productivity. Those were the three things that people were concerned about um, in terms of remote working. So I'm going to share a few aspects of that and um, I put together a framework which is a really practical way of building teams and what I'm going to do is just pull a few things out from that framework and, and use them to illustrate okay so I'm not going through the whole thing <clears throat> but I'm going to just talk about a few aspects of, of the, the framework that I put together the exceptional team blueprint and I want to give you as much value as possible so I'll go through qu fairly quickly there will be time for questions and answers at the end if anyone wants to ask any more or share any issues and concerns quite happy to do that and I think we're going to do a little panel discussion at the end as well so the first the first thing to think about is the purpose and this this applies I'll use team and business interchangeably okay because if we're running small businesses the team is the business generally you don't have lots of separate teams the, the business is the team so i'll just talk about teams but i mean if you've got a small business i mean that whole business so really important to have a clear purpose on why your business exists why your team exists in the first place because that's that's kind of the foundations of everything that you start so there's a few things people talk about having business visions I think you can have a vision for a business whatever size it is I want to be the best catering business in in Mansfield or in Nottinghamshire or in the East Midlands whatever you set your vision for what you want to do for that vision and that gives you a, a reason for doing it a reason for getting up in the morning and also gives your people it, it allows you when they're remote <coughs> to have a reason for, for for carrying on working with you a lot of businesses also have values and I think I think nowadays as well quite a lot of younger people particularly want to work for businesses who've got the same sort of value set as they have so I know people who will leave businesses whose values start to drift from what's important to them so having a set of values can be quite quite a, a good way of, of attracting people to come and work for you people who think in the same way as you people want to do the same stuff as you so you might want to think about having a set of values for your business only simple doesn't need to be all corporate and fancy but what's important to you running your business is it professionalism is it quality is it um, offering value for money whatever those sort of things are but then it's pointless just having them on a website or on a poster on the wall in the in the, the workplace you need a set of behaviors behind them so that if i walked in i would know that those people in your business were working to those values okay so if teamwork was a value how would i know if i walked in and get the people themselves to define them they'll define what's important to them from a behaviors perspective 
okay so just a couple of statements against each value really simple doesn't take a long time to do but gets people engaged in the business in a far more effective way and then finally what's the challenge and the deliverables that your business is there to do you know if you're if you're in a more of a service type business you might have certain things you need to deliver um, so why, why does your business exist from that perspective what are the challenges you, you want your people to help you deliver okay so I think having those set in place to start with is a fundamental foundation of, of whatever business you're running whether you've got remote people whether you've got a team whether it's just you actually there's some things there that are really I think quite important from a from a, um, a foundation perspective the next thing I think to think about is the people so this is who's in the business who's in the team and people have lots of different styles and preferences People have different perception, different ways of perceiving stuff. And um, when, I'm, when I'm doing this in a team, um, sort of working with a, a, a team, I'll get them to fold their arms. And I'll ask them, how does that feel? And I'll say, oh, it's natural, comfortable, I didn't have to think about it. It's really So that's your preference. If I ask you to fold your arm the opposite way, how does that feel? Well, it's a bit awkward, I have to think about it. It's not, it's not very comfortable, I can do it. If I keep practicing, I get better at it. And that's the fundamentals behind people's style and preference. So you will all have a preferred way of working, a preferred style of working. And that will be different to people in your business. People also have a different perception. So what do you see there? Just shout out. Ducks or rabbit, yeah? So some people see a duck, some people see a rabbit, you see both. People perceive things as well in a different way. And none of those, none of those styles or preferences or perceptions is right or wrong or good or bad. It's just different. Okay. And so what you need to do, first of all, is understand what your preferred working style is, what your preferred um, <coughs> way of maybe how you approach people, how you approach tasks, how you manage your time, how you make decisions. You'll have your own style. Now, some of you, you know, I don't know if ever, any of you have ever done any sort of psychometric tests. Some of you might have heard of. Myers Briggs or Insights Discovery or Thomas or Disc. There, there are loads and loads, but you can do these tests. You can you can do them online just to give you an insight into what's your preferred way. Then you need to understand what's the style of the people that work for you, and particularly the remote ones, because some people will love remote working, and some people will hate it, and that's just different styles. So you need to work out how you're going to manage those people differently based on their styles. If you don't know, ask them as well. You know, just ask them how they want to be communicated to. Ask them how they want to be given work to do. Ask them how they want to um, manage their tasks and their time and things like that. So, so that you get that understanding and then it might be different to what your preference is. So what can you then do to flex your style and adapt your style to make them more comfortable, to make it more effective? And then once you've done that, you can ask them to maybe flex theirs a bit to make it easier for you as well. And also with each other. So if you've got a team of people as well, get them to understand each other. So I, I worked at, um, in a team at Rolls-Royce once and there was, there was another guy who were both very similar ages and similar um, <coughs> levels in the company. And we never got on in meetings. We we're in the same team, but we just never got on. And we both, well, the whole team actually went through this a psychometric profile which I now use in team development, but I didn't know anything about at the time. And we found out that we were opposite on every bit of that tool that was used. So his preference was, it's, it's called extroversion. So in meetings, he would get his ideas by talking. He would talk first, then he'd think about it, and then he'd talk again. My preference is introversion. So I like to think about it, then I'll make my point. And my point might be after the meeting. It might be a good one, but it's after the meeting and then I'll think about it again and so in, in meetings I'd be sat there thinking why don't you just shut up he's just going on and on for the sake of it what's, what's he on about you know he's just talking for the sake of it he was sat there thinking why don't you contribute what's the point of you being in this meeting neither was right or wrong neither was was less or more engaged than the other we were just different styles but now we knew it and so what we started to do was play to each other's strengths on all the different areas that we were different on. And it massively changed our relationship. 
So from a personal perspective, we got on really well after that, which impacted on the business in a positive way. And I actually became his mentor because I progressed a bit quicker than he did as well. So it fundamentally affected the business performance and our performance. The next thing to think a little bit about is the skills that you've got in your team. So what are the skills in your toolbox? So the starting point for this, I think, is thinking about what skills, what do we need to deliver our business? OK, so whatever your business is, you'll need certain skills in it to deliver it effectively. So first of all, think about what those skills are and maybe do like a, a, a matrix of, OK, we, we need these skills in the business. We've got these people in the business. Who's got what skill? And make sure you're not relying on one person for too much. Make sure where you've got gaps, you decide how you're gonna, how you're gonna fill them. <clears throat> are you gonna fill them with recruitment or are you gonna fill them by developing people? Okay, but if, get that understanding of what, who you've got in your business. So again, the starting point is with you really. Know what you're really good at. Know your strengths, because that's a starting point. And then know the people in your business's strengths. Oh, great, okay. okay. <clears throat> Here it comes on. Um, so know, know other people's strengths in the business as well and think about the skills that they use outside work. So people use a lot of skills outside work that they maybe just leave at the door. So people run sports teams, people are members of school governors, PTAs, um, they might be charity trustees, things like that. People are using all sorts of skills that they might not get the chance to use at work but would like to. So find out what people do as well, what they can bring that you can use to help you in your business. I also think that we should start developing strengths rather than weaknesses. So if I'm good at something, if you make me slightly better at it, then that's going to have a bigger impact on the business than if I'm poor at something and you develop me and just make me average. <coughs> so so if, I'm, if I'm weak at something, you might make me average. That's not very good for anybody. Nobody wants to be average. So think about building on the strengths of people and filling the gaps that they've got rather than trying to develop the weaknesses. Now, there'll be some things that you have to develop, I accept, but focus on that strength side more than, the, more than weaknesses. The next thing I want to think about is how to get people committed and engaged, especially remote workers, because that's really difficult to do. So... Here you're trying to get people aligned to the goals of the business. And that's what, that's what will get the contribution from them when they're not sat in the same room as you. So the first thing is what's in it for me? W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? So why do I want to be part of your business? Okay. So as an example, I was working on a, a, a project, a game back at Rolls-Royce, and we were building a factory. And the factory was being built for cost, quality, make things quicker, take take the cost out that all, all the good business reasons but what the guy who ran the the project got us all to do who were in his team was got us to think why we wanted to be part of it and for me at the time I'd got a young family and it was about it was an opportunity to progress my career in a different area that I wasn't working in at the time so that I could hopefully provide better for my family so my whole reason for doing that job and all the ups and downs that went with it and there were some really big ups and some really big downs was because that was why I wanted to do it. It wasn't for the, for the factory and for Rolls-Royce and the business, it was because I would provide better for my family. So that's get your people to think at a personal level, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to be part of your business? Whatever that is. And then get a clear, <coughs> clear view, a clear line of sight between that overall business goal, the vision where you want that business to go and what they do day to day. So people can see the value of what they do and how it contributes. So again, really important when people are working remotely that they can see that why I do what I do contributes to that business. And give people objectives, you know, set their tasks against it so that at a real low level, I know that why I'm doing this task, it's adding value and we're going to meet that vision. So you can use that in how you manage your people if you do performance management, appraisal type stuff with them. It just allows you to have that, that link. And then you want to generate the engagement and the ownership. And I, I, don't think, I don't think you can motivate people. I don't think you can come to someone and say, I'm going to motivate you today. I don't think that works. I think what you can do is provide the environment that people choose to be motivated in. Okay. So I can choose to be motivated working for you, but you can't make me, you can't force me to be motivated. 
so think about these sort of things in how how to how to do that how to create that environment that people want to give you their commitment give you their engagement take ownership of what they do so uh, the purpose it goes back to the purpose so people understand first of all at that individual level why they're doing it try these things so most of these things are are remote working focus but some of them you can do face to face as well but if you've got remote workers get them together maybe once once or twice a week for an hour on the same zoom or teams whatever you use and get them to keep their mics off keep the microphones off but do their work and then if they want to ask somebody somebody something or share an idea or bounce some ideas around they can just come off mute say can you and me just come go into a breakout room have a chat about it and then we can come back in and it's trying just to find a way to just to, to replicate that i can just walk over to an office desk or a, in the factory and i can just ask you something it's just trying to find ways of simulating that sort of environment so you can just do you can do that remotely virtually if, if you're all on the same zoom call you don't all have to be on um, screen and stuff you can just when you want to talk ask a couple of people to go into a breakout room then go back into the main room but it just gives you a way of trying to find different ways of simulating that that environment that we've lost a bit focus on improvements and opportunities as well i think trying to get that positive view really helps people okay so don't don't always focus on what's going wrong focus on what the opportunities are for pushing the business forward and ideas help getting ideas for the future out of them people like to be asked but make sure that you respond to them so if you ask for input respond whether it's a no it might be no we can't do that these are the reasons why the worst thing you can do is ask for ideas and then just ignore it because people won't give you another idea because they say he's not interested there's a there's a technique called appreciative inquiry which um focuses on the positive stuff again so you get your people to say what are we really good at and how do we do more of that how can we build on what we're really good at and it kind of creates that that positive circle upwards rather than always focusing on the negative stuff so appreciative inquiry is something you might have a look at later it's worth having a look at and then you can do these virtual away events you know you get your team together <coughs> face to face you can do those just as effective or almost as effectively it'll never be quite the same because you don't have the bar afterwards necessarily but you can get them pretty similar by running away days and away events virtually through zoom or teams or something as long as you design them properly and as long as you run them and facilitate them properly then you can get just as much output from those as you can when you're doing face-to-face -face events so don't think you can't run team development events virtually and take a coaching approach just don't always tell them what to do ask them for their ideas ask them for their inputs ask them for solutions rather than just saying do this do this do this because again they'll be more committed they'll be more engaged in it and they'll take ownership of it because it's their idea rather than yours so those are just a few thoughts around <coughs> getting your team engaged and committed the next um The next bit I want to think about excuse me, is processes. So this is all about how your team operates. So I've got a little operating theatre here. So it's how your team operates. It's a very practical level around the ways that you work. Now, you don't need real detailed processes, but if you just capture some high level stuff around some of the things I'm going to put up in a second, I think it really helps with when you've got people working remotely they know what they're doing they don't have to find things out by hearsay when they join the company they don't have to find things out by trial and error so I worked with some some businesses the other week and we, we were face to face and it was the first time in two years some of those people had ever met so they joined during the pandemic they never met each other face to face for two years but they'd got some processes in place that people knew what to do and they could follow them so set some just high level simple things and think about things like these. I think these are some examples here. So how are we going to make decisions as a business? How are we going to solve problems? How are we going to resolve conflict? So conflict is good as long as it's positively done. So you want constructive conflict because that's how you get new ideas. That's how you get creativity and innovation in your business. But you don't want it to kind of fester and spoil relationships. You just want, you want people to constructively criticise come up with different ideas and then move on 
So how are you going to sort conflict out? How are you going to share knowledge? So show, so much knowledge is in people's heads. How are you going to get it out of people's heads so that if they leave, you're going to keep it in the business, not lose it? I'll come back to meetings and communication because I think those are the two critical things. And then how are you going to induct people? How are you going to onboard whatever terminology you use? How are you going to bring people into your business so that they know how to operate it, how to work, what jobs expected? So just think of some, some uh, processes around those. So communication, I think communication, especially when you're operating remotely, underpins everything that you do. I think this is the fundamental thing. So a few thoughts around this. And again, it's equally important when you're managing a team face to face as well, but particularly important in remote teams. So keeping contact with people, that's that's key. So if people are working remotely, if people are working from home or anywhere, you know, people can be working from overseas now. You can get people to to work for you. Depends what you need them to do, but they can be working from anywhere. But keep in contact with them. And use the phone or the or video to keep in contact. Just use this sometimes. Everybody seems to jump on Zoom or let's have a Zoom meeting. Let's have a Teams meeting. You don't need to you used to use these things before Zoom was in, was um, known to everybody. So just pick up the phone, talk to people. Don't always ask them to, to join on a Zoom because they have to set up. They might have to put something else on. They might have to think about what's behind them. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, make sure you keep in touch with people. Don't keep emailing them. Don't keep copying people in for the sake of it. Only copy people in who need to know. There's a lot of this cover yourself where I've, I've got to copy everybody in just in case something happens and they want to see that I've done the right thing. Cut out who you copy in. Don't overload people with email, especially when they're, because they're not next to you, there's a tendency just to send them an email or a, a message or WhatsApp or whatever, however you communicate in your business. Maybe give them a regular time for a, a formal, let's, every Wednesday, let's have a call at two till three. But so they know they've got a, ses a session with you at a certain time. And that just gives them, so you can save things up till then, but be available in between. So don't let people think you can only speak to me between two and three on a Wednesday. Be available to people when you're working remotely. But be aware of your own personal circumstances as well. I'll touch on time management at the end. But just think about your own personal circumstances. If you're always available to people remotely, sometimes it's, it's, it's too easy for people just to keep getting in touch and it just overloads you then because they can't see what you're doing. The other thing I think about is meetings. So we, we spend and waste a load of time in meetings, so, and therefore money, okay? So just think about the meetings that you have and, and how you run them, how often you have them, what's the point of them, who really needs to be in those meetings, all those sort of things. So you might have regular full team catch-ups. Just get everybody together on a, on a video call in this instance. So I think for full team meetings, getting everyone on video is really important. I think because then at least you can sort of see, it's not the same as being in a room, but at least you can see people. And it's much easier to manage that than, than a conference call where you've got everybody dialed in because it, people talk over each other. It's really difficult to manage. So if you can get your regular team meetings together, and again, Think about how you, you mix the formal stuff and the informal stuff. So talk about personal things as you would in an office or in a, in a workplace. You talk about family, you talk about personal stuff. Keep focus on that relationship as well as the tasks that you've got to do and the work that you've got to do. And, um, and again, people will be willing to share and they won't just as they would face to face. So don't force people to answer personal questions, but give, have that bit of an opportunity don't always make it focused on business. And again, coming back to the positive stuff, share positive news, share positive stories about what's going on, share ideas and improvements. So I work with a, a business and at the start of, we have a, a quarterly meeting with them. And at the start of the meeting, they always start off with positive news from a business perspective and from a personal perspective. And so it just, again, sets that attitude of, let's focus on the good stuff first, rather than always the negative. Encourage people to connect between sessions, however they choose to do that, so that it doesn't always rely on you. And maybe get them to have like virtual, let's just have a virtual coffee, let's have a virtual lunch, get a couple, people can just do it, but don't force it. 
because there'll be people that want to do it and there'll be people that don't want to do it. So, but just suggest things like this, you know, so let's just have 10 minutes, have a coffee and a chat, as you would if I just walked over to your workplace. Let's three of us maybe just have lunch at the same time for half an hour on, on a Zoom call, on a Teams call. Just different ways that you can try and get people to, to work better together and understand a bit more about each other. Then just want to finish with um, <clears throat> a few thoughts around performance. So this is really around what the business does and kind of how you do it as a, as a business leader or as a, as a manager or um, the business owner. And so I want to, I've been asked to just pick up a few specific things around things like technology, first of all. So there's the, um, from a technology point of view, when you're managing people remotely or when you're working remotely, I think there are a few key things to think about. The first one, and a really key one, is a microphone. So people forgive poor quality videos if I can't quite see, if it's a bit blurry, but if they can't hear it, people, it's, it's just really difficult. So if you've not got a great microphone on your, your laptop or your PC, you're working remotely, just invest in a, you don't have to spend a lot of money, but just invest in a little bit of a better microphone. That's that's the first thing. And if you do, if you did nothing else, that would impact on how you, um, how you come across on, on calls with clients or and, and, um, and as well as your people. Cameras, again, most laptop cameras are good enough. I spend a lot of time doing online training, so I've got a, a slightly better, I have a separate webcam that's a little bit higher quality, still wasn't that expensive, but I also have a, I have a second one because I stand up and use a flip chart and stuff, so I can flip between the two, and it just makes it a little bit different as well. So think about cameras, and if you need to, Maybe have a slightly better quality one if you spend a lot of time doing it. If if not, your laptop one's probably quite just just good enough. Lighting is another thing that's really important uh, as well. So, um, and it doesn't have to be. You can just use a lamp. You can use those ring lights. I've got some LED lights because I do I, I do sort of more virtual background work and stuff. But think about where you're placing the lights. So I was going to stand over there, but. The guy said, can you not stand over there because there's a window. So if I'm standing with my back to the window, I just become a silhouette. So if you're, if you're presenting or, or doing something online, always sit facing the light, wherever it is, whether it's a lamp or whether it's a window. So you have your camera on that window sill pointing this way, so it lights you up. Don't have the camera that way into the, the sun or the window or the light because it, it, people just can't see. Think about the platform. So if you use Teams or Teams or Zoom or whatever other platform you use for, for video calls and so on, Teams is great for businesses, I think. It's great for collaboration. It's great for passing messages and having team meetings. It's awful for training. I, I, if I can avoid it, I would never train on Teams because it's just really clunky and quite often things don't work properly on it. So, on. so I always use Zoom. I've used Zoom. I never heard of Zoom till March 2020, but all, all my business disappeared overnight because it was all face-to-face -face stuff. So I had to flip and, and start using Zoom for everything. So I just use Zoom all the time now. So I've just literally come back from delivering a, a three-hour Zoom training session for some managers in a business, um, which I wouldn't have been able to do because they would never have used me before. So last week I did a session in Asia for, for people in, there was some in Bangkok, Vietnam, China, Australia. So I had to get up at five in the morning to do it because it was kind of a, three-hour session with some separate groups afterwards and then in the afternoon I did something for people who had some people in America now I'd never have done that before Covid because they wouldn't have used me it would, wouldn't have been worth it uh, and I couldn't have done it so think about your platforms that you might you might want to use and how you collaborate so how do you share information how do you work together um, in um, in this sort of electronic environment so there are loads of collaboration tools things like there's something called Mural, Miro. There's Jamboard, various things that you can share. You can all work on the same board at the same time, no matter where people are working. But also Zoom have just introduced one as well. <clears throat> so in your Zoom sessions, you can just open a whiteboard. Everyone can stick electronic post-its with ideas on and you can build it up. So Zoom are constantly updating as well. So you don't necessarily need any of these external platforms as well now. So I can do everything in Zoom that I would have used a separate thing for. So things are changing all the time. And then finally, think about how you're going to manage your projects. So there's something called Trello, which is a great tool for, it's free, I think, as far as I'm aware. Um, 
for managing projects. So if you've got people doing tasks for you, you can pass the work out, you can monitor progress and all that sort of thing using some project management type software like Trello, for example, I would, I would suggest is a great thing to think about. Then just a couple more things around professionalism. So none of these are, <coughs> these aren't political statements. So I just took these off the telly. So this is a picture of the, the leader of the Scottish National Party about six months ago, I think. So we'd been through a lot of lockdown. These people, I think, should have been either trained or should be well used to using things like Teams and Zoom and have been on camera through that. So this guy here, who's, the, as I say, leader of the Scottish National Party. So he's sitting in his kitchen. He's got the, the laptop down there somewhere. He's pointing upwards, so it, it looks like he's looking down on you, or we're looking up his nose. He's looking at his ceiling. So think about, and, it, and also, he's, he's not looking at the camera. He's looking at either his picture on the screen or the person that he's talking to on the screen, the interviewer. When you're doing things through Zoom or Teams, look at the camera, because that gives the eye contact with people. As soon as I look at the screen, I'm doing that, so I'm not engaging. You look at people in the eye. So I, on my laptop, when I'm working on that, or obviously I've got a webcam that I look at, but if I'm using my laptop, I've got a little picture of a face next to the, the sort of this really tiny hole where the lens is, but that's just to remind me to look at that. So when I'm delivering, I will look at that, not at the screen, because that gives that engagement and that eye contact. Um, and also bring the, bring the camera up to your eye level. You only need to put it on a box. No one knows it's on a box. Just to bring it up so you're, you're looking level with the camera. Just things like that. It just looks a bit better. And then this is another from the same, the same session, actually, on, the, on, on the, it was Sky News. I think I took this off. But this guy, so he's got his virtual background. He's blurred it all out, which is fine. But because his PC or laptop isn't quite up to it in terms of power, it looks like he's been cut out by a five-year-old. You know, he's sort of, And then he keeps disappearing. You'll keep disappearing into the background. We've all been on those calls where people just disappear. Like, I might as well stand behind this. And, um, and that's because their, their PCs aren't powerful enough to, to cope with it. And that's, that's fine. But just put, a, just put a sheet up. Just put a bit of cloth behind you. You don't need to use virtual backgrounds. You know, so there are simple ways of doing it. And also that, that kind of thing where, he, where people disappear can trigger. I know someone who it triggers her fits and migraines. So she has to ask everybody to turn off their virtual background if it's if it's that sort of thing where it disappears. So just think about the sort of the inclusiveness as well of, of how you're doing it. So just a few thoughts there. Dresses you would face to face at least from here upwards if you're on if you're on Zoom. Um, always assume your microphone and your video are on because that um, can lead to a few embarrassing situations. Think about your background, as I say and then minimize distraction. So we've all got used to kids and cats and dogs and that's fine. But when someone walks past who maybe shouldn't have saw one the other week and I can't unsee it now, but I don't think he should have been walking past. But um, they didn't seem to notice actually. And it's, it's quite interesting what you see. But you know, things like I put, if I'm delivering something, I'll put a note on the on my front door saying, parcel delivery, please just leave it around the side of the house. I'm on a call. So rather than wait, them knocking and ringing bells, but think about not uh, getting rid of distractions. And then the final bit is all around personal life and, and balance between work and home life, really. So <clears throat> I think the first thing that I was asked to talk a little bit about was time management. So this is just a few thoughts around, just rattle through a few, a few thoughts and ideas around um, how you manage your time. Because if you, if you cost your time, if you find that you're, if you, for a week, monitor what you do every 15 minutes and keep a record of it, and then have a look at it and see how much time you waste doing things that aren't relevant to your business. So whether it's looking at social media that's personal, whether, it, um, whether it's looking at emails that you don't need to be copied in, whether it's sitting in meetings that you shouldn't be there, things like that, and see how much time waste you have. And if you spend five hours a week and say your hourly rate or your charge out rate is just 20 pounds an hour that works out to 5000 pound a year of lost time straight away if it's more obviously if it's 40 pounds an hour you charge your time at 10000 pound a year in lost time so it can be a real worthwhile exercise just thinking how you spend your time so again in, in lockdown i've spent a lot of time looking at where i went and um, to network and 
the amount of wasted time traveling and things like that I've just stopped it all I've stopped a load of subscriptions and saved a lot of time and money so think about things like good enough is good enough don't go for perfection all the time just say right I've done so 20% of the effort you'll get 80% of the results that'll do sometimes you, you might need to but you you know what you need to do but don't keep going back to things and aiming for perfection I use this because I get easily distracted so Pomodoro technique you, you break your day up into 25 minute blocks with a five minute gap in between and then have a bit of a longer break morning and afternoon and lunchtime but I then focus those 25 minutes on one thing and I set my clock count down for 25 minutes don't look at calls don't look at emails and I focus on that thing for 25 minutes and it's amazing how much more productivity I have and how much more focused I am if I've got something that takes longer I'll block out two blocks of it but I'll still have a five minute break in between but that's really worth if you get kind of distracted a lot that's quite a nice technique to, th to look up learn to say no you can say no but so no I'm not going to do it by tomorrow but I could do it for you by next Tuesday you don't always have to say yes to everything there's another book there, Eat That Frog, by Brian Tracy, and that's all about do the nasty things, do the important things first in, in the day. Don't do the easy things, don't do the things you enjoy doing, don't do the quick things, because by the end of the day, you'll have forgot, you'll have run out of time to do the things that actually that was the priority. I should have been doing that, but I don't quite like doing that. So th that, that book is, is worth a read, it's, it's a nice little book. Touch your emails once, don't keep opening, shutting them. Decide what you're going to do with it. Do it or delete it or delegate it if you've got people to delegate to. But don't keep opening and shutting them because they'll just keep building up and building up. Maybe block your time. So I only do emails first thing in the morning, lunchtime, and then just sort of end of the day. Just try and block things like that because it avoids that distraction and, and avoids um, wasting, again, wasting time. <coughs> know though that you will get distracted so build a bit of contingency in you'll know you're going to get distracted you know you're going to get interruptions so you allow for it build a bit of time in as well for that and sometimes i'll have a focus day so if i've got a big if i'm doing some writing of the book or if i'm putting a training session together i'll actually say i've just got to focus on that so i'll block the whole day and i'll just do that so sometimes i'll put kind of a buffer day in as well that just gives me a bit of breathing space so I'll say, right, Fridays tend to be quieter days for me because people don't tend to, to want stuff on a Friday. So I use that as a catch-up day. That's my buffer day, generally. If you're fortunate to have people, you can delegate to do that as well. That frees up your time. It helps them develop. It helps them enjoy their job more, particularly maybe if they're doing other things that they're um, <coughs> beyond, maybe a bit beyond what they normally expect to do. So think about how you can delegate. And as I said, manage those meetings, really, really um, get to manage those meetings. So the last, the last thing really, um, I started my, when I started my business, <coughs> I had a plastic box. I put it on the dining table at the start of the day when the, the kids had gone to school and my wife had gone to work. And I worked at the dining table and then I put it all away and they all came over and put it away. So I had, there was no real kind of differentiation between work and home I had to really try hard to, to to do that I'm lucky now because two of my daughters have left home so I've got a spare bedroom that I've converted into an office which is where I do all my stuff now so I can actually I've got a door I can shut and leave things out but I know that's fortunate to be able to do that but try and think how you can differentiate if you if you do a lot of remote working <coughs> and think about the people that work for you they've got other things going on you know, people have got all sorts of other responsibilities that they need to think about. So be more flexible with, with the time from them. So um, if, if it suits people because of their personal circumstances to work earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon and evening because they've got some caring responsibilities during the day, so what? Does that matter? Now, I know in some industries, some, some businesses, of course, you've got to have some there's some times when you've just got to be there I understand that but if people can have a bit of flexibility you could give them because it will keep them with you but manage the response expectation there so if I choose to send an email at 10 o'clock at night because that suits me in my working pattern I don't expect you to answer it at 11 o'clock at night I expect you to do it the next time you're working so just be aware of, of 
not expecting that instant response all the time that people often have. And I think focus on results is the key thing. Not So it's more focus on the output, not the input. So focus on the results, not the time spent doing it. So if, if it takes someone, someone's got a job that you need them to do, they manage their time and deliver what you will need them to do, then they've done what you needed. That's fine. So I think we need to fundamentally trust people more, especially in a remote environment. But um, so I think that's the that's the, the kind of the key, really the key message that I want to I want to give um, is is we need to be more flexible, more trusting, and focus on what people do rather than how and when they do it. So I just take a few questions if anyone's got any questions. Then I've got got a couple of slides just to kind of pull it together, which are just for two minutes, and then um, we go on to the little panel session. So does anyone have any questions or comments? Yeah, so okay. So tip tips for small smaller businesses when you've only got maybe one on just for the for the live stream, when you've only got one or two um employees, for example. I would start I would start with the the simple things like, you know, thinking about how they manage their time, taking you know, trying to st what are the what are their time stealers? What things are they wasting time doing? Get them to keep a bit of a record. So straight away you might find five or ten hours a week. You know that that, are, that you can use more productively. Think about <clears throat> how you communicate with them. So lots of the messages. Are, I think lots of these things still stand that we've talked about. Think about um, whether you have meeting. You know, just just what meetings you need with them. Think um, think for, of those sort of things. I think that's quite um, an important thing as well. But I do. I I accept that as you're particularly as you're starting out and as you're growing, you will have um, people do lots of other things. You've got to. You know, I mean, I, there's only me. I don't, as I said, I don't want employees, so I have to do everything, kind of things from finance to marketing to sales to delivery to you know. I, I and I quite enjoy that actually. But find as well, find out what people want to do. You know, ask them, ask them what sort of things they might like to do that that you might not have thought about. So just get get that engagement that way. I think that would be a th quick thoughts off the top of my head. Sorry, did you have a question? Did you? I thought you were. <laughs> okay, I saw you put your hand up. Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> Anything else? Don't worry about it. Okay, so I'll just um, sort of pull things a little bit together then. So I think if you were kind of a good business owner, a good leader, good manager, whatever you want to call yourself, you would have done, you would be doing all this already. You know, I think this lots of the stuff I've gone through already is just kind of good, good practice, really good, good team, team leadership. But if you're managing remote people, maybe just how you do it is a bit different. <clears throat> so you're still doing what you do, but just how you do it. That's what that's what's maybe changed. It might be uncomfortable for you. Think of that Ooh, folding my arms the other way. It might be uncomfortable, but the more you do it, the better you'll get at it and the more comfortable you'll become. And use it as an opportunity to improve. So I think there's a there's a lot of in a strange way a lot of positives come out so i think they reckon we're about five years ahead of digital working and where we would have been before covid so there's you know i i hardly ever travel for face-to-face -face meetings anymore it saved me a massive amount of time and cost and environmental aspects all that sort of stuff everything's just done online because people have got used to it now maybe when i'm starting a relationship with a client we'll meet face to face once or twice but after that we just do everything remotely. So it saved a massive amount of time. And some of your processes that you might have had to change would have changed for the better as well. You'd have found cheaper and more efficient ways of doing things remotely. So keep them. There's a lot of things that we can keep. And it gives you a, a lot more, <clears throat> gives you a lot more potential for increased visibility, uh, flexibility, increased productivity by doing things in different ways. 
And as I said, I think trust is the fundamental here. So if my, my thoughts are, don't try and do too much at once. If you can just take one thing away from what we've talked about tonight, then that's worthwhile from my perspective. If it starts to make a difference to your business, just one thing. Pick one or two actions that are going to have the biggest impact on your business. If you, have, if you think of too much, you just won't do anything. Whereas if you just pick one or two things, you do them. So those are the next steps. If anybody's interested, I've got a couple of team development books that I've put together. Very, very practical. I want people to write in them. I want the space and questions and challenges and thoughts. I want people to use them as workbooks, not to sit and do nothing with. But I've got a couple of, um, a couple of books there. One's a planner version. So it, it literally goes through week by week. So I use it all the time to plan my work, to plan my um, <clears throat> what I'm working on that week, what I'm working on that month, that year and so on. Um, I do put development emails out, so not, not sales emails at all. It's just one tip, focus tip every seven to ten days on one topic, just like 200 words, really quick email. So if you wanted to sign up to any emails, that's um, there's a QR code there. But also if you want to just connect, if anybody's on LinkedIn or anything like that and you just want to connect or follow on Twitter or anything like that, um, please do that. So thank you for listening. Thank you to Be Global for the opportunity to um, share a few thoughts with you. And uh, I think we're going to do a little panel discussion, are we now, Leslie? Change, change oh, we've we changed plan again. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. No, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Round of applause. Yeah, no, um, no. So that was brilliant. That's um, I was taking notes whilst whilst doing that because obviously, um, me and my team have been obviously discussing ways which um, we need to develop and and, and grow. I think um, Barbara Chambers was um, speak. Oh, the question is. So the question for the online audience is, would you micromanage uh, somebody or how would you mi micromanage if that's necessary? Okay, so I wouldn't, first of all, I wouldn't say how would you micromanage because it, it depends on their style. So I hate being micromanaged. So I used to work for a guy and he wanted to know who I was seeing, what I was doing, why, why I was seeing him, not him, what time I'd be back. And it was horrendous. I hated it. And we got on really well personally, but I hated working for him. And um, so when I got a team, I kind of took the almost the extreme way. So I assumed that people didn't want to be micromanaged as well. So um, I didn't give them enough attention. So the, the thing I would go back to is just talk to them about how do you want me to check in with you? How often? You know, and you, you'll have a view as well, but ask them what they want. But make sure you're available if they need to just give you a call or have a chat but um <clears throat> i wouldn't i wouldn't start from the point of how do i micromanage them i would start from what's the best way for us to work together and if we're not sitting in the same room if i've got a task to do you know how do you want it to be do you want that regular weekly call do you want a twice weekly or every morning or whatever but just just work it between you i would i would take that approach because don't assume that they necessarily want i just want to be left alone to do it and I assume if I'm not doing it right, you'll tell me. Or if I need to help, I'll ask you and you'll be there. But I I didn't do that enough. So I had to make an effort, which was uncomfortable for me, to be more hands-on, shall we say, in terms of managing people. And, but I got used to it and I got better at it. And that's okay. But ask, ask them what they want is my summary. Thank you, thank you. Um, just before we, we wrap up, unfortunately there's a, a number of people, um, presenters who couldn't turn up um, due to COVID again, obviously the numbers are, are rising. So um, NTU send their apologies and Faluku uh, from the Precious Network send their apologies. Uh, hopefully we'll get some information shared out to those people who wanted to hear from them uh, at a later date. But just before we wrap up, I just want to know if... Um, Lola wants to just come up and just give a, a short little uh, pitch, elevator pitch around her, 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 her business. Do you want to come up? Lola? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lola and my business all is a Will It mobile app. 
Um, I'm a lawyer of over maybe 38 years. And I found out that my happiest moments were working with the Citizens Advice Bureau initially. So living in London, I decided any cam um, county that accepted me to work as a volunteer at the Citizens Advice Bureau, I'd moved down and I sent an email to the CEO of Mansfield, C um, Citizen Advice Bureau, and he sort of gave me the go ahead. And that's how I came to Mansfield. I've been in Mansfield for two years and it's basically, I'm at the tail end of my career and I wanted to sort of do something not necessarily financially rewarding as more something make an impact or make a difference and I've spent the last two years literally going around in circles you know moving down to Mansfield and I met um, Mr. Yola of B Global and within two weeks he's literally taken the idea lips and bounds not only did I get an award I actually got what I wanted a validation from a government organization which is the East Midland Globe um, Chambers so it's like what I thought is for every idea be global would support and ensure a forward move with the organization I'm very happy you know because it sort of made me feel coming down to Maxfield was worth it. You know, I look forward to pushing um, the idea, the concept, which is basically a will writing digital solution. So it's basically very much net zero carbon emission because then we take away the wills, um, patchments or paper wills and create it online. But I think the key and the motivator was having the under 45s just have a document where they could communicate their wishes in the event of the inevitable. I'd like to use the opportunity to say thank you very much to Mr. Yola. I couldn't have, apart from the award, it was more the validation that maybe the idea is worth pursuing. And I look forward to ensuring everybody or all the over 45s in Mansfield get to note down what with the COVID, what with the so many events that happen unexpectedly, you know, and go that way. And that way we sort of help the um, pulp industries and paper industries and make sure that the carbon emissions from there goes down. And more than anything, just create so much love within the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jody. Yeah, round of applause. Yeah, and as, as soon as um, the, the app is, is going to, when it, when it is developed, because uh, you're just starting that process, um, I think we'll share that across the network as well, so obviously people can tap into that. So um, I think if there are no more questions, I think we're going to, there's some food at the back. Unfortunately, our online friends will have to go get their own teas and coffees and drinks, etc. But we're going to wrap up and have a, a, an online network, in-person networking, and, and just finish up with food. But thanks a lot for everybody for listening and um, we'll see you at next event. Oh, before I forget, there is going to be another event, 21st of July, which is a um, week tomorrow up in Bassett Law. And then um, we are joining us. We've got uh, the British Business Bank, um, people from uh, the NatWest and also First Enterprise, all talking about finance and how uh, finance can be used to um, boost boost your business and there's many different forms of finance it's just not loans uh, there are many other d different forms uh, of finance which would be beneficial so again it'll be an online uh, online events uh, but also an in-person event for Bassett Law Arts in Workshop thank you and have a good evening take care bye